All right, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's UC Ag Expert Talk. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM program. Cheryl Reynolds is also here with us and will help troubleshoot any technical problems. Please note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. Okay, so with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brenna Agerter. Uh, Dr. Agerter is a vegetable crops farm advisor for the University of California Cooperative Extension at San Joaquin County. And today she will be talking about managing fungal diseases and processing tomatoes. And now I'd like to pass this over to Brenna. Uh, Brenna, you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, all right, thank you. Good to be here with everyone today. Um, I, as, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about management of fungal diseases of processing tomato. And this is primarily geared towards the commercial production of processing tomatoes here in California, but I know we have somewhat of a diverse audience. So I am gonna direct a few of my comments um, specifically to the home gardener, but that's gonna be a, a rare instance. Generally, I'm gonna be talking about commercial production of processing tomatoes. I'm not gonna be able to talk about all the diseases of tomato because there's actually quite a few. Um, Tom Torini, my colleague, Tom Torini, Fresno County Farm Advisor will be giving a talk about viruses um, on April 6th. And that's part of this same seminar series here with UCIPM. So um, check that out and, and consider registering for that on April 6th. Um, there are also a lot of diseases of tomato that occur in, in more humid climates that we luckily um, rarely or never see here in California, such as late blight, early blight, leaf mold, and the list goes on and on. So I'm not gonna touch on those at all because um, we just, we either don't see them here or they're so sporadic that they're just not important. So what I will cover um, is listed here. I'm gonna talk about powdery mildew, a few of the soil-borne diseases that are that are most important here, um, and then black mold, which is a, a fruit rot disease. Okay, so tomato powdery mildew. Um, so worldwide, powdery mildew of tomato is actually caused by three different pathogens. Uh, the first is Lavellia latorica. This was um, first reported in the U.S. in 1978 in California, but is now spread throughout. North America and to a lot of other countries. Um, that, this disease is restricted to arid or semi-arid conditions. Um, in California, it's, that is the primary mildew pathogen that we see in field-grown tomatoes here in the Central Valley. The second powdery mildew disease is a oidium neolycophersi. This was first found in, Ca in Canada in 1994. Um, and subsequently in the US a couple of years later in 96, and now is distributed throughout the world. Um, this disease is favored by more humid conditions and is particularly problematic in greenhouse production. Um, here in California, we do see it um, in greenhouses and in coastal production areas. And this photo was taken from Sandy, a, a garden in San Diego. A third um, powdery mildew disease of tomatoes is oidium lycopersis, and this is, as far as I know, is only found in Australia and then in very limited areas here in California. Um, is not not the most important mildew disease here in California. So in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the the first one, the Lavellula. Okay, so early symptoms of this disease are these um, yellow or light green lesions, which may or may not have visible sporulation. And with time, the, these areas grow larger and sometimes the yellow can be very bright. It often can look like you know, yellow paint was kind of splattered on the leaves. Um, note that the, the lesions are kind of irregular in shape. And as the disease progresses, these lesions become brown or dead and necrotic. And then adjacent, uh, Lesions coalesce, resulting in larger necrotic areas um, like you get here. Um, and also just more of a general, with time, you get this more general yellowing of the leaflets. Sporulation sometimes is abundant 
and could be easily seen with the naked eye. And other times it's the sporulation is really sparse and you could only see it with a, you know, like a 20 X hand lens or with a dissecting scope. And the spores are formed on, can be on either side of the leaf. This is what it looks like um, in open field tomatoes when, when the lavellula has um, really uh, done a lot of damage. Here you can see the powdery white sporulation and the yellowing. Plants are infected by airborne spores. Um, so it's just spread in the, the air and the mildew, as far as we know, doesn't survive in the soil. It doesn't survive on old crop debris or anything like that. So it doesn't carry over. As the disease progresses, the leaflets um, or entire leaves become dead and dry out but they do stay attached to the plant. And when, when the conditions are right, this progression to this complete necrosis of the foliage can happen fairly quickly, especially um, as the crop approaches harvest. Talking here about processing tomatoes. At the field level, um, a mildew this is what it can look like. A mildew problem can, can under the right conditions, rather quickly turn a field from green to yellow and then, and then to brown. Um, if, if the temperatures aren't too high and the field's close to harvest, a scenario such as this one, you know, might be fine for um, processing tomatoes, um, but wouldn't, would be less acceptable for fresh market tomatoes. Because if you lost that foliage and you've lost the fruit cover, um, if the temperatures are high, you can get sunburning of fruit, um, and sunburn, of course, renders the fresh market tomatoes um, unmarketable. For processing tomatoes, the sunburning of the fruit reduces peelability during processing. Um, it also increases the susceptibility of the fruit to, to black mold, as I'll, I'll mention later. Hosts of um, Lavalia tarica include over 1,000 crop and weed species in 75 different plant families, both monocots and dicots, um, but it mostly affects herbaceous plants, so not, not woody plants. Hosts include um, alliums such as onion and garlic and leek, um, also in the in the solanaceous family, we've got tomatoes and peppers and potatoes, um, as well as eggplant and some of the solanaceous weeds are affected. Um, and then, you know, there's some other hosts. But, but what we see is that not all hosts may be infected in all areas, suggesting that there is some degree of host specialization. So what we know from isolates collected here is that at least under experimental conditions, under greenhouse conditions, the tomato was able to be infected by isolates that were taken from pepper and onion, cotton, sow thistle, and ground cherry. So there is some degree of host specialization, but um, it's, not, it's not complete. So um, we don't really know what the important alternate hosts might be that, that uh, affect the tomato outbreaks. Okay, this is a weather station out in a processing field. So mildew in the tomatoes is favored by mild temperatures and high humidity, and it's suppressed to some degree by high temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the 1990s, um, a weather-based model was developed at the University of California at Davis. Um, and so we evaluated, a, a group of uh, farm advisors evaluated this model for three years working in commercial fields um, to validate the model and found that it, it, you know, it, it, it worked to some degree, but it was not very accurate in predicting those fields that would develop the most serious problems. Um, so that was, a, that was, you know, wasn't reliable in that sense. And we believe that this is because there are a lot of other factors aside from the weather that will determine uh, which fields develop severe disease. And I'll, I'll talk more about that but varieties um, is, is an important one. So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there is room there, I think, to, to improve the model by incorporating other factors, but as it stands currently, it's, it's not being used commercially. 
Okay, so about 10 years ago, a group of us uh, cooperative extension farm advisors conducted a set of field trials over a four year period um, in various locations throughout the Central Valley from, from Solano and Yolo County up in the north down to Fresno County um, in the central San Joaquin Valley. And we were uh, evaluating control group programs and varying the spray intervals and different you know, timings and things. And we're trying to look at both what was the optimal dates for spraying and also what were the best materials. But we were also interested in what was the, you know, what was the impact of this disease on yield and, and fruit quality. So this chart shows the results from these 10 trials that were conducted over four years. And it shows the um, percent of the foliage affected by mildew um, on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis shows the different trials, you know, different years and different locations. Um, and so the blue bars indicate the disease levels in our non-treated control plots. So that we had no disease control measures. And then the green bars are the plots that got a weekly treatment of sulfur dust starting at about six weeks after transplanting and until two weeks prior to harvest. And the asterisks indicate when there was a significant difference between those, between the blue and the green bars. Um, so as you can see, um, sulfur dust in each trial, sulfur dust significantly reduced the disease, but the, the degree of reduction varied by the, by the trial. The other thing to note is that despite the intensity of a weekly dusting program, which is, that's not, that's, much more dusting than would be done would be done commercially. So I don't think anybody's doing a weekly program. It's more like two to every two to three weeks. So despite how intensely we were um, applying sulfur, the disease levels still sometimes remained fairly high at twenty to thirty percent of the foliage affected. So this kind of highlights the difficulty of controlling this disease in in certain situations. And we were working with a highly susceptible variety, um, 6366, which um, is not, uh, it's still grown, but not on much acreage anymore. This chart summarizes what the yield impacts were in our trials. So the, the vertical axis here shows the percentage by which the yield um, differed between the sulfur treated and the non-treated plots. So for instance, in that Fresno County trial in 2009, that's on the left, the sulfur treated plots yielded 30% higher than non-treated, okay? But you can see most trials, there was no significant difference in yield. So um, I, I wanna point out that in most of these, the mildew came in relatively late, um, like during August, and this would be about one month prior to harvest, which would be um, for these trials was in mid to late September. But in that, in that one trial uh, on the far left, the disease did get started in July. So um, it looks like mildew that comes in, in during the last month is not gonna likely to impact yield, but if it comes in earlier, it can. Okay, this chart summarizes the impacts on soluble solids or bricks in the harvested fruit. So the, um, the vertical axis here is the difference in degrees bricks between treated and non-treated. Okay, so the most, the highest one there is a difference of 1.4 bricks between um, sulfur treated and non-treated. So as you can see in, in, in almost every trial, the fungicide programs um, increase soluble solids. In some cases, it was fairly dramatic. Um, and if you average, all those effects um, over all the 10 trials, it's about a half a degree bricks um, advantage from controlling mildew. So from these trials, um, the outcome was not any kind of a specific calendar-based recommendation, but um, we do have some general um, comments that we could make about timing. So um, we learned that, as I just showed, that mildew increasing one month prior to harvest can affect soluble solids without affecting yield, but earlier disease um, can reduce yield if it's more than one month prior to harvest. And then um, because this disease has a fairly long latent period, um, you, you need to do preventative applications, especially um, if you're in an area like a late season planting area where, where disease pressure is high because by the time you see symptoms, the, the fungus has already been in the plant for, 
for several weeks. And a two week treatment interval, I think is, is, is often sufficient, but may not be um, sufficient when disease pressure is high, it may be too long. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about managing the risk of fungicide resistance development. So um, when I started working on tomato powdery mildew, we only had materials in a few different groups, but um, there's been a lot of development of um, new fungicides and we now have um, these different groups. So these are um, the FRAC group numbers, which um, indicate the chemistry grouping, but also um, for resistance management, those are the groups that you need to rotate. So um, the highest risk for developing resistance are fungicides that have only one frac group in them. So, you know, these, these materials that are in this top section would be medium to high risk for developing for resistance development. Most of our, many of our new materials have more than one materials. So they may be combining a seven plus an 11 or 11 plus three. And these are lower risk for fungicide resistance development um, by combining those two different groups. And then down here we have um, lots of low risk materials. So sulfur, um, low risk, uh, the biologicals um, and any of these in inorganic salts and things like that um, should be as far as we know um, very low risk for resistance development. It's not, not documented to, to occur. Okay, so um, as I mentioned early, er, earlier, the, that the latent period is long for this disease, so we do recommend early treatment. So um, if you are in the Central Valley production area and you have a later planted crop that's gonna be harvested in mid-September or later, starting a control program at the full flower stage um, may be warranted, but especially if, if there are reports of mildew in the region, that way you know at least that there are spores in the air. Um, consider other target pests and diseases when you're choosing a product. For example, sulfur we know has good efficacy against tomato russet mite, so it might best be deployed earlier in the season while um, the fungicides in groups seven and 11 have efficacy against uh, fruit rot. And so if you apply those about six weeks prior to harvest, then you may be getting a benefit for both mildew and, and black mold. Our mildew fungicides are not systemic, so good coverage is important. If, you're, if you have the option of spraying by ground, it's greatly preferable to spraying by air. And as I just mentioned, you know, resistance management, it's important. We have seen some, um, the development of some um, resistance to some of the fungicides, uh, pretty minor, but a little bit of resistance. So um, let's keep, you know, using these good, good product rotations and also including sulfur dust in the program when feasible. Sulfur dust is, is very effective and, and low risk for resistance. Um, so, Here's some images of, of sulfur dust being applied. And in California, um, there's been a shift um, to these ground rig applicators for sulfur dust, um, driven both by the increasing problems with mildew, but also driven by uh, you know, the adoption of buried drip irrigation systems that make it easier to, to do um, ground rig applications during the season. So, um, we've seen a pretty major shift um, away from air and towards ground. And I, I think that's, that's great. And I think it's one of the reasons why um, mildew has been actually in recent years has been less of a problem. I think the varieties we have now are not as susceptible. And then um, I think that the, the ground rig um, sulfur applications are, are, have been very effective for us. Okay, so um, we know that um, here's some other factors to think about. So we know that young plants are less susceptible, so you don't need to protect young plants. There's, there's no need to, to spray anything, um, probably up until uh, full flower, you're probably good. Late, we know that late season fields ex experience heavier pressure. So if you're early planting, you, you most likely don't need to spray, but if you're in a later planted field, especially ones that are um, adjacent to earlier planted fields, those can experience some of the heaviest pressure. 
And we know that variety tolerance to mildew varies. And like I said, I think that um, some of the more susceptible varieties were not growing anymore. So that has helped us a lot. And we know that plant stress can, can exacerbate mildew problems. So whether that's you know, a soil borne disease or, or a, a soil problem, another soil problem, um, just keeping the plants healthy in general can, can help with uh, avoiding mildew. All right, I'm gonna shift gears now and talk about some of the soil borne diseases. So um, what I'm gonna do is talk um, a little bit about each of these diseases and then I'll go in a little bit more in depth on control of soil, being, soil borne diseases in general after I've talked about them. So um, I'm at, I've got Phytophthora and root knot nematode grayed out here because I, I'm not gonna, those are somewhat important diseases here. Um, root knot nematode in particular is on, is a problem that's on the increase here, but I, I don't have time to talk about everything. So I'm gonna focus on the ones that are those first four listed there. Okay, so verticillium wilt, um, you can see symptoms here of verticillium wilt on processing tomatoes, the, the um, drying of the, the leaves here. Um, I often see it um, in June when things, when it starts to heat up um, and the plants get a little bit stressed by that first heat and um, it becomes evident that there's a problem. And um, that leaflet drying often, it's the terminal leaflet that, that dries out first. And sometimes you see the characteristic V shape on the leaflet um, where the leaf dries in a V pattern, but that's not always um, that obvious. If you cut into the stems, you see this light brown vascular discoloration, and that extends up the stem a good distance, you know, up, up the branches. Verticillin wilt is, is very widespread in the California tomato production areas. Um, I'd say that most fields that include tomatoes in their rotation have a detectable level of, of verticillium wilt, although it can vary in, in uh, how much, how many microsclerotia there are. Verticillium has a, has a wide host range, but there is host specialization. So that means that, you know, we know there's verticillium in, in strawberry and lettuce, but um, the, the different, there are different strains that specialize with different hosts. In California, we have tomato races two and three, um, and these have overcome the VE resistance. So um, all the commercial, you know, hybrid tomato varieties, you know, have um, V, you know, the notation V or verticillium resistance, but um, that was overcome by the, the populations that we have now. So um, it's, it's basically, having that VE gene is of some benefit, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help completely against races two and three. And verticillium is very long lived in the soil. So it forms microsclerotia, which are these um, overwintering or you know, resting structures. Um, it can also survive in fields by colonizing other plants. So even if you rotate out of um, hosts, you know, rotate to a plant that's not a host for verticillium at all, you can still, it can still survive in the soil and can colonize other plants. Verticillium is a cooler season disease, so it does, um, does well in the spring and the early part of the tomato season here. And um, is kind of suppressed by the higher temperatures, but by that time, it's already, by the time we reach higher temperatures, it's already, you know, done its, it's already done its damage. Okay, this is fusarium wilt. Right now um, in, in processing tomatoes, we're dealing with race three of fusarium wilt, but the other races are um, also present in California. So you, you can potentially see those in, a, um, in another setting like a home garden setting or small scale uh, uh, farming operation where you may be growing varieties that are susceptible to, to all the races. The Latin name for um, the Fusarium wilt pathogen is Fusarium oxysporum, former specialis, former specialis like a persisi, and I, we abbreviate this as FOL for short because it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so you see this bright yellow flagging um, on branches that are infected with Fusarium wilt, and the rest of the plant might be green. 
And then as it progresses, um, you know, the foliage can turn necrotic. And if you cut into the vascular system, you can see this dark brown discoloration that extends up to a foot or more above the, the soil line. And this generally is a darker vascular discoloration than you see with verticillium wilt. This is some data on survival of fusarium from other um, hosts, different, different fusarium pathogens. So the pathogen of cotton and the pathogen of lettuce. Um, so they're currently studying the, the, the pathogen from tomato. There's studies that are underway looking at soil survival. And I believe they're at about the two year mark and they can still detect uh, the tomato pathogen in the soil. So we think that probably the tomato pathogen survives in the soil for two to three years. However, that's in the absence of any plants. Um, so if there's other plants besides tomato, um, they can be infected, even though they may not show symptoms. So um, it's a little confusing, but FOL is, is specific in the sense that it only causes disease on tomato, but it can infect a lot of other crops and it doesn't cause any symptoms, but it, it, it's, it's not impacting those crops. But if you go back to tomatoes, the pathogen is, is going to have, have maintained itself. So um, we had a lot of interest in looking at rotation crops. And so um, Cassandra Sweat and her research group at UC Davis Plant Pathology have been conducting field trials um, in infested soil, looking at different rotation crops. And so this is Kelly Pa, she's a, um, a postdoc um, in the Sweat Research Group at UC Davis. And this is her field trial results. So the, the the bars, the height of the bars here indicates the number of plants that had the number of tomato plants with fusarium wilt symptoms following um, these different crops. Okay, so like last in the previous year, there was pepper and now there's tomatoes and how many tomatoes have fusarium wilt. So basically the take home here is that the higher risk crops to rotate to are pepper, sunflower uh, and melon. Okay, those would be um, you know, just as appears to be just almost as risky as growing, not rotating and just growing tomato back to back. Um, warm season weeds do contribute some, but not as much as these high risk crops. And then um, chemical fallow means keeping the, the, the field weed free and then lima bean and cotton seem to be lower risk than the others. Okay. And now switching gears and talking about another fusarium disease. This is a crown rotter, um, Fusarium oxysperm formis specialis radicis lycopersisi, or FORL. And this one um, can see here in this photo, there's a you know dark brown lesion at the crown, right at the soil line that you can see from the outside. But then if you cut into it, it's really dark and very large. Um, canker there under, underneath. And this disease um, causes a fairly slow decline over, over a month period, um, generally happening late season. So in the, in the last month before harvest. And with this one, we don't see the vascular discoloration that I've mentioned for vert and um, fusarium wilt. And then, We've got another fusarium disease, which um, has more recently been added um, to the mix, which is fusarium falsiformi um, that's causing a crown and foot rot and also vine decline. So, um, and at this point, I just wanna say that this, especially with the arrival of this pathogen, it makes laboratory diagnosis very important because um, it's very hard to differentiate these different fusarium diseases in the field. Um, even for experts. So really getting a laboratory diagnosis is, is very important. Um, it's the first step uh, in, in kind of in your IPM program is knowing exactly which, which disease you're dealing with. So um, this, here are some pictures of the symptoms of this disease um, on the left before it was cut open and then in the middle after it was cut open and then a cross section of the stem. So it is causing a crown rot and, and vine decline. And it is fusarium, but it's a different, different species. 
And we're doing a lot of trials with this um, pathogen right now, both in commercial fields and at Davis. And one of the things we're looking at is um, cultivar, cultivar tolerance. So we know we don't have resistance um, to this like we do for Fusarium wilt. We have Fusarium wilt resistant varieties, but we don't have um, resistance to falsiformi. So you can see here um, a variety that isn't resistant, but is doing very well in an infested field. And so this is um, some trials at Davis, and I'm not gonna go into depth here on the varieties, but I'm just gonna tell you that we are putting together um, data from a, a large number of trials that were conducted in commercial fields and on campus. Uh, I think we have something like eight or nine trials and we're putting that all together and um, gonna have that information available soon. So probably not in time for um, variety decisions this season, but um, certainly for next year. But if you are making decisions currently um, for, for this coming season, um, get in touch with me and I can give you some suggestions about varieties that, that, that seem to do well in um, infested fields. So this was a trial um, at Davis, and then this is a trial in a field here in San Joaquin County where we had both Fusarium wilt and um, Fusarium falciformi. So definitely there is differences between varieties in terms of how well they yield in the presence of Fusarium falciformi. Okay. All right, so southern blight. This is um, caused by the fungus Sclerotium rolfsii. Um, and it causes a pretty um, distinctive white, so it's causing a crown rot. And then if you look at the crown right here at the sole line, there's this white mycelium. And in some hosts, you can see these um, kind of unique looking sclerotia that form within the, as the plant dies, that these form within that white mycelial area, but these tend not to form in tomato. So I, I've seen them more commonly in, in potato or um, often like pepper is a, um, they seem to form on pepper, but they don't seem to form very often on tomato. This fungus has a very wide host range. Um, most vegetables are susceptible to it, including potato, um, uh, a lot of other vegetables, beans, uh, turf grass, sunflower, so wide host range. Um, as I mentioned, the sclerotia tend not to form on tomato. And so the good news here is that we don't, tomato crops, growing tomatoes doesn't seem to increase the levels of sclerotia in the soil. So they're, they're not, um, you're not making the problem worse by growing tomatoes back to back. A huge factor with this disease is high temperatures. So like, you know, temperatures in the 90s or, you know, over 100 really trigger this disease. And we've been seeing more problems with it in the last, uh, you know, five years. So when you, once you get this crown rot, it's a pretty rapid death. You can go, uh, it can be like a week from having a healthy plant to having a dead plant. So that's faster than with some of these other diseases. And I'll go, I'm gonna go more into depth on, on soil borne disease management, but I just wanna briefly mention that for this particular disease, keeping the tops of the beds dry um, does help because the, the fungus needs moisture right there at the, at the soil line. And so if you can keep that area um, dry, then that will reduce the probability of infection. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk some about crop rotation. So I've mentioned it already in the context of certain diseases, um, but you know, what their host ranges were. But for, for these soil borne diseases, um, you're generally gonna want it to avoid crops that are in the same family. So um, pepper, potato, and eggplant are the, you know, the main crops that are in, that in the tomato family. Now that doesn't mean, I mean, I, that doesn't mean that you can't grow tomatoes and potatoes in the same ground. It is totally possible, but you're just increasing the risk of of having a disease problem. And particularly if you, if you know you have a, a soil borne disease problem, it's, um, it's gonna be high risk. 
for um, for some of the diseases, cucurbits are a host. So um, Phytophthora capsicea in particular is a um, attacks cucurbits as well. So cucurbits are not a good rotation for that disease. For fusarium wilt, um, the cucurbits aren't susceptible to the tomato fusarium wilt pathogen, but they do seem to be, um, from, the, from the crop rotation studies at Davis, they do seem to be um, a risky rotation crop for fusarium wilt. In general, we, we know that small grains tend to be the best option for, for rotation. They, they you know, are the least likely to be um, infected by the tomato pathogens. All right, so now switching gears to sanitation as a strategy for soil-borne diseases. So um, this is a new area of study for our group. Um, with the outbreak of broom rape, which is a um, parasitic weed pest that's an A-rated pest, um, uh, we've been having outbreaks of broom rape um, in recent years, and that has prompted um, some interest, uh, quite a bit of interest in cleaning equipment. Um, and so harvesters, uh, tomato harvesters have um, pretty heavy debris loads on them. And from our study, we've learned that they also have pretty high microbial loads. So we've swabbed harvesters and looked at fusarium. Um, and um, this study was looking at the effectiveness of cleaning, the type of cleaning that would typically be done um, at the end of the day, cleaning, but then going beyond that to looking at um, pressure washing and applying quaternary ammonium as a um, sanitizer. And um, the, the combination of quaternary ammonium treatments with air and pressure washing was the most effective. Um, pressure washing alone um, didn't seem to, to do the job. But no matter what they did, it, no method was completely effective. So this isn't, uh, you know, sanitizing equipment's a good idea, but it's it's not, you know, the complete answer to avoiding spreading uh, fusarium between fields. But they're going to continue working on this, um, especially in light of the the broom rape outbreak that's ongoing in um, Yolo County. So this this work will be continuing. Okay, um, I've been working um, in infested fields, in commercial fields, looking at um, KPAM or METAM applied through the drip. Um, and so I'm making these applications like three or four weeks before planting through the drip um, to try to control um, some of the soil-borne diseases. And I'm not gonna go into detail, great detail here, but this is a slide that attempts to summarize um, trials that have been conducted by different people in different years at different locations, but all in commercial fields that had some sort of a disease problem, whether it was uh, Fusarium falciformi or Fusarium wilt or um, verticillium. And um, the average yield effect at these study sites um, was 9.3 ton increase from using uh, METAM, potassium or KPAM. And we had, do have different, that does include different rates. So I can't, I'm not gonna make a, a rate recommendation or anything, but um, so if, um, and I've got some math here, which includes a price of $90 per ton for tomatoes, but um, actually for the current contract price, it looks like it's gonna be $105 per ton. So um, with, a, with a nine ton increase, you, you can pay for, um, you know, we tend to think of fumigation as being too expensive for tomato production. And, and I think that's true in a typical field, but in a field that has disease, um, I think it is, uh, it can be economically justified. Okay, I think I'm gonna, I wanna mention the concept of fungistasis because I think a lot of people have this idea that fungi can grow in soil, but um, in fact, most fungal spores are not able to, to germinate in soil and, and fungi don't grow in soil. They colonize organic substrates in the soil um, and they can grow out through soil only from a substantial food base. So um, that's something to keep in mind <laughs> as we talk about soil-borne disease control. So um, 
I'm just going to touch on these briefly. Each one of these slides, on the next few slides I'm going to show, each one of these could be an hour long talk. So I know I'm not giving, um, you know, really uh, what's due to each of these topics, but I just wanted to, to touch on them. So there is some interest in um, using cover cropping to suppress soil borne disease. And the idea is that if you can increase the overall microbial activity in the soil, that that suppresses um, diseases. And some of this is by the microbes competing with the pathogens for nutrients, um, and then some of them produce uh, fungitoxic compounds. Um, and we know that trichoderma, a fungus in particular, is, is promoted um, by certain cover crops. Also with cover crops, you can see improvements in soil tilth and drainage, and to the extent that good drainage um, helps prevent diseases such as Phytophthora. So in, in those situations, um, cover cropping may benefit Phytophthora. I mean, it may benefit the, avoiding Phytophthora. There are some cases where cover crops might actually harbor disease, but these are pretty rare. So um, there is a situation with vetch um, and verticillium wilt where um, the vet, some cover crops, some leguminous cover crops can be a host for verticillium wilt. And if you're interested in that, I can give you, uh, I can give you more information about that. Because it's not all leguminous cover crops. So, okay, biofumigation. So um, mustard cover crops, um, mustards are high in glucosinolates. And as the um, cover crop, if you work in the, you know, um, the mustard residue in, as that mustard residue breaks down, it releases isothiocyanates and those can act as a natural fumigant. And it's a similar, very similar to the action of uh, Metam actually. Krishna Subarao, who's a um, UC Davis plant pathologist um, based in Salinas has shown that broccoli residues are suppressive to verticillium wilt um, there on the coast. There hasn't been much work on that for California tomatoes, um, except that um, Jean Miao and colleagues did, did do a test, and that's what's in this photo here, looking at um, mustards for control of fusarium wilt in tomatoes, and it was in their hands um, was not effective for fusarium wilt. But again, not a lot has been done with this. I think that's um, an area where um, you know, more work could be done. Another alternative to fumigation is anaerobic soil disinfestation. Um, this method was originally developed in Japan um, and it's been tested in a number of different crops in the US, but, um, and has been tested um, for tomatoes in Florida, but not in California. Um, here in California, a lot of work's being done and this, this picture's from over on the coast. A lot of work's been done um, with organic strawberry production as an alternative you know, to fumigation. So for ASD, um, basically you provide some kind of a carbon source, which is food for microbes. And in this case, um, they're using rice bran, but there's um, studies that have looked at other waste products such as almond holes or any kind of waste product that could be a carbon source for microbes. So then you irrigate um, and you wanna saturate the soil and then the soil's tarped. And the tarping, so normally when you tarp for fumigation, right, you're trying to keep the fumigant in, but with this tarp, you're actually trying to keep oxygen out because what you wanna do is create anaerobic conditions in the soil. And as the carbon is broken down under these anaerobic conditions, it releases volatile uh, organic compounds and organic acids that, that um, suppress disease. Um, and in coastal um, strawberry production, it's provided pretty good control of verticillium and microsclerotia um, and, and yields, strawberry yields similar to the, the standard fumigant. So um, again, not a lot of work's been done in the tomato system, but the potential is there. Um, I wanted to just briefly talk about soilborne disease control in the home garden um, and just say that depending on what race of the pathogen you have, it, it could be a little bit of a different situation than what we're dealing with in commercial fields. And in a, in a garden setting, you might get good control with the modern, modern um, hybrid that has you know, your standard disease resistance package. So sometimes if you've got heirlooms that are having problems, maybe just growing a, a, a hybrid variety might, might do the trick. 
If you're loyal to your heirloom varieties or other susceptible varieties, um, grafted plants is an option. So um, there's some nurseries that are now selling um, grafted plants and they're a little expensive, but um, you know, they, the rootstocks are generally pretty disease resistant. So that can be a good option. And then also if it's, you know, feasible for you to undertake a project like biofumigation or solarization, um, those could be good options for, for the home garden. Okay, we've just got a few minutes left. I'm gonna briefly touch on fruit rot. So this is, um, black mold, which is caused by um, alternaria. And it's promoted by um, wetness. So whether that's dew or sprinklers or any kind of wetness on the fruit promotes disease. And moderate temperatures are also conducive to this disease. Um, it often gets started on, on fruit that are uh, damaged by sunburn. So you can see here the fruit have that pale area that's from exposure to high temperatures and they get sunburned and then the mold starts to develop on those areas. I want to talk about chemical management and these, these, this information on this slide was based on over a decade of field trials that were conducted by Jean Miao and, and his colleagues um, looking at, at chemical control. So they found that the most effective timings to apply uh, fungicides for black mold control were six and four weeks before your anticipated harvest date. And those timings were even more effective than using a weather-based uh, model that tried to you know, predict when um, the fruit rot would happen. So um, you know, normally you'd think that maybe a, a weather-based model might be more effective than a calendar, but in this case, um, the calendar was actually was better. Um, and additional sprays beyond one or two generally had uh, greatly diminishing returns. So a single spray is really the most economical thing to do. And one limitation though of chemical control is that even with the best timing and the best material, the fungicides um, program still can only cut the percentage of black mold in half. So if you were gonna have 10% mold, the best a, a fungicide can do is cut that down to 5% of your fruit. So there, it's, it's not perfect. Cultural controls, so timely harvest, of course, this is often beyond uh, the grower's control. Uh, it often has to do with lots of factors um, with the cannery and, and you know whatnot. But timely harvest, we know, um, helps because overripe fruit become highly susceptible to rot. And we recommend for late season processing fields to use EFS or EFH, if EFH cultivars, which are um, you know, less resistant, I mean, more resistant to rot. Um, you might wanna consider vine trimming to promote airflow. So vine trimming, um, for those of you that uh, don't know, is, a, is a, um, you know, trimming the vines in the furrow, and that just allows a little bit of airflow through, through the canopy and then avoiding um, sunburn or other fruit damage by just keeping the canopy healthy. Um, in the, the home garden, um, it would be often black mold is starting on split, split fruit. So avoiding those varieties that have that fruit splitting and just trying to generally managing to reduce fruit splitting and then not, I think everybody, home gardeners know this, but you don't wanna, you don't wanna overhead sprinkler water fruit. And just want to acknowledge my colleagues um, and the, the growers and PCAs that I work with um, to, do, to do this research. And much of it was funded by the California Tomato Research Institute. So um, if you're um, a grower or processor that, that is a member of them, thank you for your contributions. Um, so the first question is from Mike and he's asking, what has been the prevalence of these diseases in the past few growing seasons? And then he specifically references powdery mildew as well. So powdery mildew has kind of was on the increase. It got really bad in 2007 and it was bad for, it seems like maybe five, six years. And then it's kind of been less now. So that one kind of has gone up and then kind of gone back down. It's not gone away, but it's definitely not as bad as it was. Um, Fusarium wilt was probably our um, 
worst disease, but now we have varieties that are um, resistant to race three. And so now with, I think somewhere between a third to half of the loads delivered this past season were um, varieties with resistance to race three. And so that makes it actually hard to find fields now with Fusarium wilt. Um, not hard, but I mean, it's, they're much less common. Um, Southern blight is, I would say, I wouldn't say it's on the increase, but I would say that it's up, we're kind of up to a plateau that's higher than where we were in the past. And I'm not sure why, I don't have an explanation for that. Um, but we know that it's, I mean, it, I guess, you know, some we've had more heat waves and it's definitely promoted by heat waves. Um, uh, verticillium, I think, is always already been widespread for many years, so I don't think that's really changing in terms of its prevalence. It has been widespread for a long time. Fusarium falciformi is, I think, um, is a relatively new pathogen and I believe is continuing to spread. So I think that's going to be the one that, uh, that's the one I'm most concerned about at the moment. We don't have resistant varieties. Um, we don't know that much about rotation crops. Um, and um, I think, you know, we still need to learn more about that disease. So that's a primary concern. Um, I think that probably answers it. Um, okay. So with that covered, um, we've got two more questions here. Um, Joe is asking, can you clarify the fungi stasis statement? Okay. So what I'm talking about with fungi stasis is that fungal spores that are sitting there in the soil are, are unlikely to be able to germinate. And they really are only going to germinate if there's a root nearby. So they're not going to be growing around in the soil. They're just going to sit there in the soil and just wait. And, you know, often probably they'll eventually die right after a couple of years, they'll die, but otherwise they're just going to sit there in the soil and they're going to wait. <laughs> and when a root, um, when a root of a plant, and it doesn't have to be a host plant, but when the root of a plant is nearby, it leaks out nutrients. It just, plant, root, plant roots are just kind of leaky. And then the, the spores can sense that and they'll germinate and infect the root at that point. Um, so, I don't know if that helps clarify. I'm, I was just trying to make the point that, that fungi don't grow in soil. They, they grow on substrates, whether that's dead organic matter or whether that's a root, they, they grow on organic matter or plants. They don't grow in soil. Yes, that seems to have answered his question. Great. Thanks. Um, and then Robert is asking, have phosphites been looked at as a preventative treatment? Um, so I'm not sure which disease this question refers to, um, but um, you know, yeah, he, he I, I, didn't have, specify. I have used phosphites um, in um, I, downy mildew trials that I've done. And I've looked at them for phytophthora control in a number of different crops that I've worked in. So I've worked with phosphites, but I have not used it for powdery mildew or for fusarium. So I guess that answers that. I haven't used it for the diseases that we were talking about today. Okay, great. And we just got another question from Daniel. I think this will be the last question that we take. Um, do you think having fusarium wilt resistant cultivars can help with black mold issues by avoiding vine decline? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think it will a lot. So, I mean, having stronger vines that are either resistant or tolerant to the soilborne diseases keeps the vines healthy, then the fruit are protected and they, you get better, you know, you have better fruit quality and they're going to have less black mold because the black mold really goes crazy on fruit that are, that are, you know, exposed. So yeah, I think we're going to see less mold problems with, with the fusarium wilt varieties we have now. Okay. Okay. So with that, um, Thank you everyone for attending. Thanks Brenna so much for this information. A lot of, a lot of information packed into one hour, um, but I, I think we can close out now. Thank you everyone. Have a great day.